over to Andrew. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, as Rob said, my name is Andrew McDonald. I'm a partner at Fox Rothschild. And importantly, this is part two of uh, the information that we're providing about vaccine mandates. So um, if you have any questions about more of the, the substance of the rules, especially the federal rules, which um, spoiler alert, I will tell you later are, are basically blocked by the courts. Um, if you have any questions about the substance of those rules, um, we can you know, talk to Rob or Aaron and, or, or me and we can get you at the PowerPoint from the last presentation, which really went into the, those rules in depth. Um, and essentially at this point, we don't necessarily need to worry about them for the moment, but they could at any time come back into force. So uh, we'll talk about the, the legal challenges, the status of where these federal rules are in the courts. Um, and then we're gonna, I'm gonna also talk about um, some private vaccine mandates from private employers, some municipalities, including Philadelphia, and also how to deal with um, exemption requests and requests for accommodations if you if your business is actually subject to any um, vaccine mandate. So uh, let's get started. So a very quick overview. Uh, as I said before, these rules are now not in, in effect. They have been blocked by the courts, but there are two very pertinent rules, federal contractor mandate. Um, it applied to any federal contractor or subcontractor. Uh, and it applied to government contracts after mid-October. And this was a, a pure vaccine mandate. There is no option for testing instead of vaccination. It was a pure vaccination rule that covered um, employees of a contractor, subcontractor, um, even some who weren't directly working on the federal project. The other rule was the OSHA mandate. It's called the ETS, the Emergency Temporary Standard. This applied only to certain employers with over a hundred or more, hundred or more employees. And this was a, um, a rule that did allow for a testing option instead of just vaccinations. So um, again, not to go too in depth, back to the, the federal contractor mandate, the deadlines, uh, and since we last spoke, uh, moved again, the deadline, if this rule had gone to effect or if it comes back into effect, uh, the deadline would be January 18th. That may or may not be extended if this rule ever came back into effect, um, but it required uh, masking, physical distancing, vaccination, the designation of a coordinator for uh, testing and mask, uh, vaccination and masking uh, issues. And um, it applied to federal contractors only. The ETS, this is the OSHA rule. Uh, this had an employer choice of either full vaccination policy or this vaccine uh, vaccination or testing policy at the option of the employer, not the employee. So the employer would pick, I'm going to have either a full vaccination policy or a vaccination or testing policy. There were other requirements in this rule, face coverings for anyone who's unvaccinated, time off to get vaccines verification process for vaccination status, reporting to OSHA and giving certain information to employees. Again, this rule, both of those rules are not in effect. They have been blocked by different federal courts. So the federal contractor rule, I believe it was about a week and a half ago, perhaps two weeks ago, was um, a, a federal court in Georgia issued an injunction that applies nationwide. This injunction is still in effect it hasn't been appealed or changed or modified by the, um, the judge in that case. So because of that judge's decision, the federal contract rule is not in effect right now. Uh, it can't be enforced by the government. Uh, it can't be used by a government agency to you know, claim that you've breached a, the, the contract by not having someone vaccinated. It is on ice. It, it can't be enforced uh, until uh, that court or another court above the district court uh, says otherwise. The OSHA rule 
is uh, there's a little bit of a different terminology for the OSHA rule. It has been stayed. There's not an injunction, but it has been stayed by uh, the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, it had this rule had originally been uh, uh, stayed by the Fifth Circuit, uh, but as I explained in the last presentation, if you had the chance to listen in, there was uh, a series of other challenges across the country, including some challenges brought by uh, unions in more liberal leaning uh, court districts and circuit court districts around the country. And because there were all these challenges against the same rule in different courts, there was actually a lottery that happened. So like a ping pong ball was actually put into a drum. It was spin, it was spun and then uh, out popped the sixth circuit. So all those cases were consolidated with the sixth circuit, which is an appeals court that sits in Cincinnati. Um, and they haven't changed anything of what the fifth circuit did. So the fifth circuit stayed that rule said, OSHA, oh, sure, you cannot enforce this rule. It's not in effect. And the Sixth Circuit inherited that case among, with all the other cases, and it has not touched the stay. So um, what is next with these rules? Uh, I can't tell you. Um, at any time, the federal contractor injunction could be undone. It could be actually, to use the same word, stayed. Um, by the uh, the appeals court that sits above the Georgia District Court, which is the 11th Circuit, um, or it could go up to the Supreme Court and they could uh, change that ruling and, and undo, dissolve that injunction. Um, but that is probably unlikely. Same issues with the uh, the OSHA ETS. The government has made a motion to dissolve that stay. It was called an emergency motion and it was filed before Thanksgiving. The court did not act on it quickly. It ordered all briefs to be filed by last Friday. And it, which is, you know, given the gravity of the issue here, the deadlines that uh, employers would have faced uh, to comply by December 5th was the original deadline for some of the requirements of the ETS. The court said uh, essentially, they don't, they, we don't care. We'll just have all the briefs due uh, December 10th, which was after that effective date. And they haven't ruled on anything. They haven't ruled on this motion to dissolve the stay. They haven't confirmed the stay. The stay is still in place. So um, we expect a decision from the Sixth Circuit sometime this month, probably, but the court has no real deadlines. It can operate however it wishes. So it could sit on this for weeks. It could sit on this potentially for months if it really wanted to. It could ask for more briefing. We're not really sure. It could also issue a decision today. It could issue its decision tomorrow. Um, it's unclear. So we'll have to just keep monitoring the situation. Um, it should be noted that both of these circuit courts, the 11th and the 6th, are generally seen. Doesn't mean that uh, any decision is automatic but they're generally seen as more conservative. There's more Republican appointed judges than Democratic appointed judges. So it is unlikely that these rules will be revived by either of these uh, courts of appeals. And then we have the Supreme Court. So any ruling from the, the circuit courts of appeals, so the one, uh, the 11th circuit down in Georgia, Sixth Circuit in um, Ohio and Cincinnati, that area, um, any decision, whether it's against the mandate, for the mandate, will probably end up at the Supreme Court. And it could end up on uh, the Supreme Court's emergency docket. Some people call it the shadow docket, where it, it, um, it issues emergency expedited orders, sometimes with one line, you know, this appeal is denied or this appeal is granted. Sometimes there's um, a, some you know, brief discussion of why the Supreme Court is ruling one way or another. Um, it is in all likelihood going to end up before the Supreme Court um, by early next year. But again, no idea what's gonna happen from this point. Um, there's a few things to note that are very important for you to know 
if these rules ever come back into place. So prior to the federal contractor injunction being issued, the government extended the deadlines for compliance. It, kept, it has moved it back on, on uh, two different occasions. The first due date, effective date was December 8th. And then when OSHA put out its rule, they moved it to January 4th, which was another OSHA uh, deadline in its rule. And then after the rules, the OSHA rule was stayed, the federal, the, the government moved the federal contractor uh, rule back to January. So in all likelihood, we don't know, but it is, it is likely that if these rules come back into effect, the government will push the deadlines forward. It won't say, it likely won't say, again, we don't know what's gonna happen, um, that now they're in effect immediately, the court has reinstated these rules and they apply right now starting this moment today. Um, the, if the government did that, it would set itself up for you know, a tremendous amount of appeals based on failure to you know, have any time to prepare, uh, failure to get their, the staff ready to roll out any policies, to do exemption requests, accommodation requests, so that if the government were to, um, you know, find or, or seek a breach of contract action against a contractor or, or try to debar them from future federal work because they didn't immediately comply uh, with the uh, vaccine mandate that went into effect without uh, much notice, that, that would set up the government for a lot of arguments of why that penalty should not be assessed. And in all likelihood, they would want to avoid that. Again, you never know, um, but if, if I were to bet on this, it, it is likely that they would, uh, that the government would extend these deadlines if the rules came back into effect. So as of right now, the federal vaccine mandates you know, applicable here, uh, federal contractor mandate, the OSHA ETS, those are not in effect. In addition, the government had another um, rule vaccine mandate for healthcare workers through the Medicare and Medicaid services, CMS. That rule has also been enjoined by a court um, somewhere in the Midwest. So not the, the federal rules are really not in effect. Um, however, that doesn't mean that all vaccine mandates are unlawful. That doesn't mean that the, the fact that these federal rules have been struck down means that all other types of mandates uh, go away. The federal government for work on federal property or other governments on work on their own property can still require vaccination, masking, distancing, whatever you want, whatever they want essentially, when you are working on their property as a condition of, of entering the property and performing work. The, these government mandates were, were going beyond that. And they were trying to say, not only are the employees who are gonna actually work on this property need to be vaccinated, but your other employees need to be vaccinated because you're a federal contractor or because you have a uh, hundred or more employees. So this does not mean that if you have a job on federal property uh, that you can you know, bring this court decision in and show someone and say, well, you know, I don't have to, I don't have, my employees don't have to be vaccinated or don't have to wear masks. The rules for federal property, however that agency sets them will still be in effect. And it would take uh, a tremendous amount of overreach for the, government rules on government property to ever be um, undone or reversed by a court. So generally, if you're doing work on federal property and they say your, your employees have to show proof of vaccination, you're gonna have to follow that rule. They'll likely have an exemption request process um, and you would just deal with the agency, your agency contact, perhaps a general contractor if someone's in between you, if you're a subcontractor. Um, so just be aware that just because these federal rules have been overturned or stayed, paused, uh, that doesn't mean that the government can't make rules for work on the government property. There are also municipal mandates. 
and uh, especially concerning for this group is Philadelphia. Philadelphia has one for contractors, and I'm going to discuss that rule in a little more depth uh, later. New York City has a contractor mandate. New York City also recently has a new mandate for all private businesses in New York City. So um, if you are doing work outside of your local area, you're going to want to check to see if there are any government mandates on either the state or local level. And in addition, you know, project owners, general contractors can still require a vaccination as a condition of performing work. So it's, it's not that all vaccine mandates are now unlawful. Um, private businesses can impose vaccination, masking, distancing requirements on their own contractors and their own employees. So um, it's best to, to check to make sure if uh, you know, the projects that you could be working on may have uh, vaccination requirements. So let's talk a little bit about Philadelphia. Um, back in September, on September 14th to be specific, the city put out an order to city contractors. This order can be found on the, the city website under their COVID emergency orders. The city has done other orders for healthcare employers, for um, colleges and universities, and those types of institutions have been identified by the city as, um, as businesses, as institutions that need to have uh, vaccination for employees, staff, vendors, students, um, people who are operating in that business or institution. So this order though, back in September, is really a masking order. Um, it says that masks are mandatory in public areas of public buildings. So that's number one. So if you're not in a public area, but you're in a public building, you don't have to wear a mask. But if you're, if, if you're in, uh, sorry, got that wrong. If you're in a public area, public building, got to wear the mask. But if you go to a non-public area, away from where the public could go, then you, your employees might not need to wear the mask. At the same time, you have to keep a staff list of people who are vaccinated, who are unvaccinated. But that's limited to the people who are going to be working in city buildings or working on city projects. And then for those people, you have to keep proof of vaccination if the city asks for it. For anyone who's unvaccinated, they have to wear a cloth and surgical mask. So this is key because this rule presumes that there's gonna be unvaccinated employees working in city buildings. Um, so it is not a vaccine mandate. It is just keep a list of employees, who's vaccinated, who's not. You're in public areas, you gotta wear the mask. And, and people who are not vaccinated have to wear these two masks at all times in public or non-public areas. And the city acknowledges that there could be employees who, who need accommodations for mask wearing. Um, and those are usually people if they have asthma or some sort of uh, condition that makes them not able to wear the mask. Uh, the consequences of breaching this rule are that the city could say you've breached the contract or also that they could bar you from future work. Um, if you don't comply with that rule. Now, there's another vaccine mandate that has recently been put out by the city. Um, as I wrote here, it's not actually displayed as a actual rule under the city's COVID regulations. Um, I don't, the city has done this before. The healthcare and um, higher education vaccine mandate was announced, it was discussed, it was on the news. The actual order didn't show up for, I think it was two weeks. So we can assume that this is real, but the parameters and actual terms of this rule have not been made public yet, um, which is kind of concerning because of the deadlines that I'll talk about right now. So this is a vaccine mandate. It is not like the other rule where it assumed, the other rule assumed that there were going to be some unvaccinated employees. This is city contractors must ensure employees are vaccinated. 
and that is by January 14th. Um, as I said, I just said, you know, there's no actual rule published by the city. So we don't know right now whether employees means just the employees uh, working in city buildings on city projects. Um, that's likely to be the case. Uh, or if the city is trying to go beyond that and trying to reach uh, employees of contractors who aren't working on city projects. Um, it will we'll see when they put out the text. Um, but it is unclear right now. Uh, the press release also talks about how exemption requests are due to the city project managers by uh, December 20th, so next week. And uh, any employees who are subject to these exemptions who are entitled to an exemption and do not have to be vaccinated for a medical or a religious reason, they have to wear an N95 mask. So the city has changed its view on masks you know, the last mask mandate in uh, for contractors in September was this double mask with a cloth mask and a surgical mask. Now they're saying N95 mask and regular testing. Not sure if that means weekly, daily, bi-weekly, monthly. We'll have to see when this rule is actually published. So uh, you really need to be on the lookout for especially municipal vaccine mandates, uh, more likely to follow. Uh, you might've heard on the news, there's a vaccine mandate for restaurants starting soon in Philadelphia. I talked about New York City before. Um, counties could make their own rules. Cities, um, maybe government agencies that are you know, like a port authority or uh, you know, that get to make up their own rules on their own property. The best thing for you to do is to communicate with anyone who is either above you as a general contractor, if you have a liaison with the owner, with city project managers or any type of municipality, um, because the these are coming out kind of fast and furious. Uh, like I just talked about, the Philadelphia rule seems to be um, issued via press release instead of an actual order. Um, you do not wanna be caught flat-footed find out after the fact that you've missed a deadline for a, um, a vaccine mandate if you are aware of it or not. So the best thing for you to do is to stay in as much communication as possible and find out if you are subject to a mandate of any kind, masking, vaccination, anything. Um, it's also important to talk about private mandates. So the owner of the property that you're doing work on, a general contractor, a client, if you're in a client's building, um, they can all require, they can all legally require that their contractors, so your employees um, are either vaccinated or if they're not vaccinated, that they have to wear certain masks or get tested. Um, these are all things that, that a private entity is allowed to do. So, um, courts have upheld private vaccine mandates. <clears throat> a great example of this is the court that originally paused, stayed the OSHA rule, uh, I believe it was either yesterday or two days ago, upheld a private vaccination mandate for United Airlines. So that same court that said, you know, the government OSHA, you cannot impose this, this vaccine mandate on employers with 100 or more employees, but United Airlines, you can impose a vaccine mandate for your employees. So the courts have not uh, treated private mandates the same way as government mandates. So you should assume, unless you hear otherwise, that private mandates uh, are legal and have to be followed. Uh, there may be challenges in the future of whether these contractors, owners, are uh, try to go beyond just the employees that are working on their project. Um, if that is the case, then your best bet would be to consult legal counsel. Um, but generally, these private mandates are legal and lawful and um, not something that is going to be struck down in. So again, like I've said before, your, your best bet is to assess, keep a lookout, 
see if your business is subject to any mandates. Um, the communicate with anyone who, uh, whether it be a client, owner, general contractor, whoever you can to see if there are any vaccination requirements. Um, also, if you haven't done it already, um, and the chapter has provided some guidance on this, is to continue to prepare for these possible federal mandates to come back into effect. Um, it is better for you to have a policy ready to go if they ever come back into effect than to scramble and try to put one together um, if it ever came back into force. So um, those are not officially dead until the Supreme Court says so, is, is the advice that I'm giving. So uh, they could spring back into life at any time, but we will just have to see what happens with the courts. Um, I've been getting, and I know uh, that businesses have been asking a lot of questions about exemptions and accommodations. And uh, there are some very specific rules for the, the first step of whether an employee is entitled to an exemption. And then the second step, if that employee is entitled to an exemption, what kind of accommodation can the employee receive? Because it is not always the case that an employee who's entitled to an exemption from a, a vaccine requirement or a masking requirement, uh, it's, you don't absolutely need to provide an accommodation under certain circumstances. If you've ever dealt with accommodation questions pre-pandemic on other issues, you'll know that there are just some um, disabilities, medical issues, religious issues that cannot be accommodated. So um, it is a case by case, individual basis. It is unwise to try to give a blanket uh, treatment of exemption requests and or a blanket treatment of accommodations. So you're gonna be dealing specifically here with requests for exemptions from vaccine rules, masking rules. Testing is also out there. It is, um, I don't, I don't really don't see a way that an employee could could ask for a make a reasonable ask. You know, employees can ask for anything, um, but make a reasonable ask for exemptions from testing. It's not the kind of rule that really or, or issue that affects religion or uh, medical issues. But you never know. Um, you may face a request for an exemption from testing rules. Um, we'll see. So here are. I've charted out the four grounds for exemptions. So we have disability, religious, non-disability medical issues, and I'll, I'll talk about the distinction later, and then philosophical. So the first step, if you get a request for an exemption, is to ask the question, is this employee entitled to an exemption? So where we look for legal entitlements, we look for another law that's out there that says employers have to make exceptions to their rules for certain issues. So uh, the two main issues are disability and religion. So the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA, uh, requires employers to provide uh, exemptions to rules, accommodations to employees for disabled employees. We'll talk about that definition in a second. Title VII of the Civil Rights Act also provides for um, exceptions, accommodations for religious employees if a work rule conflicts with that religious belief. Now, there are also employees that are just not entitled under law to exemptions. So that, those include medical issues that are not a disability. So if it is not a serious enough long-term kind of chronic condition that is not a disability, a medical issue may not, under the law, uh, create a legal entitlement for that employee to have an exemption from some work rule. So it is, it is important to try to get down to the, uh, to the facts of the case to see whether the issue that the employee is bringing up is a, a disability issue or just a, another kind of short-term medical issue. Um, the other type in your, your if you're going to get exemption requests for any mandates, you're going to get some people 
some employees who are going to have philosophical objections that I don't think you can require me. You don't have to do this. I, I disagree strongly with vaccines or whatever they're going to say that isn't religious, it isn't medical, and it's not a disability related request. Those uh, people who are giving philosophical objections are not legally entitled to an exemption. So non-disability medical issues. So think pregnancy, broken arm, things that are not chronic long-term conditions. They will often, employees with those issues will present a medical note, or if they don't present a medical note, you can ask for a medical note um, to be exempt from vaccine mandates generally. Um, in most cases, the, you, should you should honor these requests. Um, and that's especially the case if there's a doctor's note. So it's, it's not the best place to be in to tell someone with a, a doctor's note says I'm pregnant, I, don't, um, I can't take the vaccine because my doctor's not recommending it. Um, that person, oddly enough, may not be entitled to a legal requirement for an exemption, but uh, generally you should honor those requests and the rules, the OSHA rule especially, had made it very clear that non-disability medical issues, uh, exemption requests should be honored, that those employees are not the type of employees who need to be vaccinated. And as I noted before, if someone just has a philosophical objection, they, they sh that those requests should not be honored. Um, those will, will create a myriad of issues for you if you start giving philosophical um, exemptions because other employees will start to say, well, you know, maybe I disagree with the vaccine all of a sudden now too, and I don't want to have to take it. Um, and it will undercut the, um, the force of the vaccine mandate. If it's not your own mandate, if it's being forced on you, maybe a private mandate by a general contractor, um, they are probably not going to be very happy if they find out that you're just giving out philosophical uh, exemptions because, uh, you know, some employee says that they just don't agree with it. So it will lead to probably to possible legal issues. It could lead to issues with your general contractor, property owner. Um, and so you should, if they don't fit into uh, these types of entitlements, unless they're medical, should not be honored. So um, you're also going to be confronted with people who kind of throw everything at the wall and see what sticks. And um, you need to know what the rules are for religious exemptions. So religious exemptions do not, you, an employee is not required to bring like a note from a priest that says that the teachings of this church uh, uh, forbid vaccines. You may get that, but employees don't have to do that. They can simply say, I have a quote, sincerely held belief that's religious and it conflicts with this, with this work rule, this requirement for a vaccine. And there's case law over the past few decades that say courts are not allowed to decide whether a religion is real or not. Um, they can look to see whether the belief is, is social, philosophical versus religion, but they're not allowed to decide whether a religion is real. Um, people can have non-traditional religious beliefs. So what do you do when you get this request? The guy is saying that it's religious in nature, but you don't buy it at all. Um, you have to be careful if you question it. The um, flip side here is that if you question an employee too much about their religion, that can actually be seen as being discriminatory toward the religion. And you may be building a case for that employee for religious discrimination. So you don't want, you want to make sure that the request is real. If it is ambiguous, unclear, you do want to ask questions, but you want to keep them to basically the following questions. You know, how long has this employee held the belief? Did they just dream up this belief last night after the vaccine mandate was published? Um, has this belief uh, 
impacted their health decisions? Have they not taken other vaccines because of this belief in the past? Have they actually taken vaccines in the past? Or is this just a brand new issue that has sprung up because of this vaccine? And the same thing applies to other medicine. So a lot of the objections we'll see is that um, employees will object to the use of um, aborted fetal cell lines and the testing of these vaccines that are out now. Well, those cell lines have been used in Tylenol, Advil, flu shots, all types of medicine that the employee who's coming up with these, with this exemption request probably has taken uh, and may have taken in the recent past. So um, you're trying to find out essentially, is this someone who's like a um, Jehovah's Witness or someone who has really held this belief that vaccinations or something that's in the vaccines is a, is that conflicts with their religious belief and that has driven their medical decision-making throughout their lives or at least bef you know, before today. Um, but if you go beyond the scope of these questions, start to question whether the religion is real, whether the employee has uh, made up this religion, you're gonna run into problems. So it's, it's really testing whether they really sincerely hold these beliefs or not. So back to the issue of medical exemption requests. Um, the, the term disability under the Americans with Disabilities Act has a very particular definition. It is something that is a condition that substantially affects a major life function. So what does that mean? It means that it is a condition that in the long term has a, uh, a meaningful impact on any sort of life function. And life function is as broad as you can think about it. The law says it's eating, drinking, working, walking, thinking, um, and uh, any type of condition that like cancer that uh, impedes a bodily function. So um, these are not issues though that are quote minor and transitory. Transitory meaning that it will go away in the near future. So pregnancy, is not a disability. Um, it may affect life functions, but it will go away. It will um, not be present in the you know, woman's life forever, like asthma might. So someone who has asthma, chronic condition, not going away anytime soon, um, and it affects the, that person's ability to breathe. That person disabled under the law. Broken arm, pregnancy, not disabled in most cases. So if someone is entitled to an accommodation, um, so that person has a religious uh, exemption, qualified for a disability exemption, or you're going to grant a non-disability medical um, exemption, then there are different standards. So the non-disability medical there's no, because there's no legal entitlement, there's no specific process that you have to follow, but you should treat it just like a disability request. So the, the rule that you have to follow is a reasonable accommodation, some sort of change in work rule that doesn't create an undue hardship on you. Religion is the same language, reasonable accommodation, undue hardship, but for whatever reason, the courts have found that those same words mean different things in different contexts. So um, disability accommodations, if you've ever dealt with disability accommodation requests, you'll know that they can be very fact intensive. It can uh, require a lot of time trying to figure out what the employee can or can't do, if you can let them work from home, if you don't need to let them work from home, if they you know, need time to uh, check their insulin or something like that, you're gonna have to give it to them, but you may not need to require, uh, allow a diabetic employee who can't control their blood sugar from working um, you know, as an electrician or in any sort of capacity where uh, they could put others in um, threatening, life-threatening situations. So it's gonna be a case-by-case -case basis. And those questions can be difficult. It's best to not deal with them quickly. 
take the time, engage with that person to figure out what uh, accommodations can or can't be uh, given to that person. Religious accommodations, for whatever reason, the Supreme Court has decided that um, employers have a little more leeway. Undue hardship under the under Title VII for religion means basically anything that changes your operations slightly, you don't have to accommodate that person. And uh, there's a court case about how a religious uh, employee for an airline wanted an exemption for uh, not to work on either Saturday or Sunday. I forget which one. And uh, the employer had a scheduling system that scheduled people for Saturday and Sunday. So the court said, don't have to give that person an accommodation. That would not fly under the disability accommodation test. So um, there are different standards and you should try to work through with the employee to figure out if there's accommodation that can be given. These accommodations have to be individualized. You cannot make a broad-based rule. Everyone who uh, applies for an exemption or anyone who qualifies for an exemption is gonna get X accommodation. That would be unwise to do because the, the employer and the employee are supposed to engage in what's called the interactive process to try to figure out what accommodation is uh, available, could be available to that, that person. You sometimes wanna check and you're allowed to check and get a, the employee to have a doctor's note about what kinds of things he or she can or can't do. Um, now, specifically for, we're talking about vaccine masking uh, rules here, the accommodations are likely going to involve, say it's a vaccine exemption, masking and testing, or just masking, or just testing. Uh, the accommodation is not set in stone. There are some mandates like that city of Philadelphia one that says they got to wear an N95 mask. That is imposed on you, you'd have to follow it. But other types of accommodation requests you're going to have to have an individualized discussion with that person and try to figure out um, what is available. And you're, 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 for people who aren't working in the field, you know, your employees who aren't out uh, performing work, if they work in the office, you're gonna probably get exemption requests to, and accommodation requests to work from home. And you'll have to deal with that and see if working from home is even something that's available to that person or do they really need to be in the office and you know, able to get physical files or things of that nature. So it's gonna be on a case-by-case -case basis, based on your business, based on the individual's condition, uh, and it is not wise to address these issues quickly. So um, the accommodation issue can be very time-consuming. Um, I we always recommend that if you have it, you should consult with either an HR uh, person, if you have an HR contractor, if you have outside counsel, um, they can really help with the accommodation issues because you can easily lead yourself uh, and build up a lawsuit really for a disgruntled employee who's already disgruntled that they don't wanna take the, the vaccine. Um, so you wanna make sure that you, um, you know, dot your I's and cross all your T's. Uh, finally, I wanna talk about labor law. Obviously, um, it's an important issue for your industry, for anyone who's on this call. Um, any part of a pure vaccine mandate that has no options, that the government or a private entity is telling you, you need to have vaccinated employees to work. Um, that is not something that unions can demand bargaining over. Um, that's something that's being forced upon you. That's a requirement that you um, have to have in order to perform that work. Um, if there is part of a mandate that allows you to have an option, the OSHA rule is the best example. Um, and it's, you know, the employer gets to choose between full vaccination policy or vaccination test policy, those kinds of things can be bargained over. Unions can also demand what's called effects bargaining. Um, so that is a more limited type of bargaining that says, okay, employer, I know you have the power to issue this rule 
and we're not we don't want to bargain about the roof itself but we want to bargain about what is going to happen to our guys now that you've put this room so is it like extra sick days or time to get vaccinated or like you know a hundred dollar payment to go get vaccinated they can demand that kind of bargaining um importantly and last time i think when when we were talking it was a little bit up in the air because that osha rule was so new um if you receive any bargaining demands, information requests, send them to the chapter, send them to Rob, send them to Jeff, send them to Aaron, send them to anyone um, at the chapter who can handle this. We're the bargaining representative and um, it will be handled and, and we will take care of those issues. Um, my understanding in, in, in this industry, other industries, um, unions have been a little less aggressive than I would have assumed. Um, and probably in recognition that these mandates are mainly being forced upon uh, employers and there's really not that much you can do. But if you have any um, you know, disputes arising, demands to bargain, information requests, send them up the chain um, and they will be dealt with. So um, that is all I have. Um, so if you have any questions, you can either um, ask them or write them in the chat. Thank you, Andrew. And uh, everybody does have the ability to unmute yourself. So if you do have a question, please feel free to unmute. Um, we did have a, a question in the chat box. Um, so when it comes to testing, is there an acceptable or a rapid test being accepted that you can purchase at a pharmacy? So yes, so it, there may be a particular rule that says you have to have a certain type of test, but using the OSHA rule as an example, it basically allowed any sort of test that's been approved that you could buy in a pharmacy. Um, and that rule said that the employer had to kind of watch the test at some point, but without that rule being in effect, it's rapid tests, at-home tests, those can be used. My understanding is that they're kind of hard to find these days. So um, there may be a problem in actually getting these tests. Employers went out and bought them and are hoarding them because they thought the OSHA rule was going to go into effect. So, you know, large companies went out and bought thousands and thousands of tests. Um, so they, you may not actually be able to get them is the problem. I assume that more tests, uh, testing kits are going to be out uh, in stores, but you never know. But rapid tests are generally acceptable for tests. Thank you. Any, any other questions? I see Hearing a question me. in the chat. Um, oh, it looks like it's a direct message to me. So um, if federal mandates are allowed to resume, do you foresee the government later attempting to require booster doses as part of vaccine mandates? Um, yes. If they were to come back into effect, I think that the, uh, the definition of full vaccination would be a, any, uh, would be the two doses, a booster. And as we move into the new year, we're gonna start to run into people who, who got their vaccines 12 months ago. Um, and my understanding uh, is that these vaccines were intended to last for 12 months. So um, I think that the, any new mandate, if they come back into effect, or the government tries again after it fails, if the Supreme Court finally says, no, you can't impose, impose this rule, OSHA could try again. The contractor uh, task force could try again and they could um, redo the rule. They could publish it quickly like they did before. I'm sure people, employers will jump into court and challenge it again. But um, I would assume that any new mandate, if it came back into effect, if they revised it, would have boosters, new doses, um, anything that keeps the vaccination record current. Any other questions? Hearing none, I will uh, share Andrew's contact information after this presentation. So if there are any do that do come up, please contact me or Andrew. Um, I just want to say this will be added to our website, this recording. So if there's anyone else at your company that would like to, to hear this presentation, it will be online. Um, and then with that, we're, we're going to conclude.
And next month, we are continuing our industry hour series with a uh, new NECA premier partner, Buckingham, who will be talking about their safety solutions. So that um, industry hour is set for January 24th, and I hope you all can attend that. Um, with that being said, I'd like to conclude and wish everybody happy holidays. Thank you.